Good morning, everybody. Show hands, how many of you have been listening to podcasts for less than one year? All right, how about three years? How about five years? 75 years? <laughs> Just checking. Podcasts have been around for a long time, and three things about them have been true from day one. First, podcasts are an engagement medium. Podcasts are personal, they're intimate, they're long form. Listeners engage with them for 30, 40, 60 minutes at a time. And they don't just live in the background. They get immersed in them. They get excited when they know that an episode is coming and they see a notification popping on the screen letting them know it's arrived. And this engagement matters now more than ever. For decades, the most tried and true way for advertisers to build brands was television, which, like podcasts, is an engagement medium. But as time went by, ad-supported television lost share of time to Netflix, which doesn't have any ads, and social media, which people use a lot, but in snippets of time. The result is an attention deficit disorder for advertiser. It's advertising. It's very hard or expensive to fight consumers engaging in the media long enough to be engaged with the ads. This is one of the areas where podcasts are unique. 78% of consumers don't mind the ad on podcasts because as an industry, we have managed to keep them interested, engage them, and spares. Second thing, podcasts have always been an emotional medium. Sound is where the emotion comes from. Most people don't realize this until they watch a movie or an ad with the sound turned off. It's robbed of the power to emotionally move you. In fact, Mindshare's Neural Lab recently studied how people interact with media on their smartphones. And they observe that most consumers are engaging with smartphones with only one sense at a time. They're either watching the screen without their headphones or listening without looking at the visuals. And they set out to prove or disprove a myth that a lot of people take for granted, the myth that visuals are more powerful than audio. They did it with a combination of EEG galvanic skin response, and eye movement research. Plugging all these sensors, they set out to compare their reaction to audiovisual ads, to visual-only ads, and audio-only ads directly on people's brain. And they found that audio-only ads actually perform better than video-only ads by 21% higher emotional intensity. And audio-only ads had 89% of the emotional power of audiovisual ads. But this includes all kinds of audio ads. So we went back to Mindshare and asked them to do a study specifically for podcasts, your brain on podcasts, comparing their ads against the most prevalent video units on smartphones, social media, video units, on, and, and YouTube. And here's one fascinating first find. After people listen to a single ad on one of our podcasts, trust in the advertising brand went up. And after listening to a single, or watching a single social media video ad, trust went down. They also found that podcasts are more memorable than social media ads, especially towards the end. Retention goes up at the end of a podcast ad, and it goes down at the end of a social media or smartphone video ad. In fact, here's a cool visualization of your brain listening to podcasts and your brain watching a social media video ad. You see all that area in red, it's called the frontal cortex. You want more engagement towards the end, and that's what you get with podcasts, 38% 30, 30 higher memory encoding at key branding moments. And the same thing happens with emotional intensity. For podcasts, it goes up at the end, and for social media, video and video smartphones goes down. Why is this important? Because emotional memories are way more durable than neutral memories. And they also found that podcast host read, podcast ad, had 30% higher emotional intensity than social media video ads. But even producer read ads had 23% higher um, emotional intensity. So if you're a brand spending a significant share of your dollars on soundless advertising, you have to wonder, is your brand on mute? Third, podcasts have always delivered sales. It is no coincidence that to this day, 
the majority of advertisers on podcasts are directly measuring the effect of their campaigns on conversion and sales, and they keep renewing and buying premium inventory ahead of time. All of you guys here in this room know it because the ads keep working. And this too matters now more than ever as digital media becomes in general more expensive and prone to waste. So podcasts are, have always been engaging, emotional, and great at delivering sales. But now podcasts are adding a magical ingredient, reach. 90 million Americans listen to podcasts every month, according to Edison Research. This number is from March, it's probably higher now. That's one in three people, 12 plus. We have reached a tipping point. Tom Webster, somewhere in the room, told the New York Times sitting the largest percentage point increase since 2006. It gets better if you look at anyone under 55. 39% of people, 25 to 54, and 40% of 12 to 24s listen every month, the fastest growing demo in the last year. And the affluent among them, 54% listen every month. What's behind all this rapid growth? I have a theory. Hit podcasts are drawing new and casual listeners to the medium. It's been six years since Serial took the wall by storm by redefining what a hit podcast sounds like and how many millions of people listen to it. Millions of people all over the world didn't even know what a podcast was, and now they're listeners because of Serial. And as these listeners are coming to the space, are stumbling into lots and lots of other podcasts about comedy, about entertainment, about business and history and tech, about news and society, about true crime, about sports, audio drama, kids and family, and so on. My company, Wondery, is behind some of the biggest event miniseries of the last few years, from Dirty John to Dr. Death, or My Dead Body, The Chic Next Door, Gladiator, and Man in the Window. In addition to that, we represent some of the most immersive ongoing miniseries, including Business Wars, the lead, Imagine Life, Sports Wars, and American Innovations. And we're just one of many companies that you hear from today. The quality publishers that deliver uh, quality and scale, engagement and emotion, sales and brand lift. In fact, just today, we announced that we're doing a partnership with NBC News and MSNBC to bring their portfolio of podcasts to Wondery and produce new podcasts. And today, for the first time, I'm very proud to reunite on stage. We never have them uh, in the same place before. The host of five of our biggest miniseries. All of them are award-winning reporters from the world of print with deep experience who have created the first ever podcast with Wondery, collectively generating 130 million downloads. Please help me welcome Pace and John, Bob Holder, Laura Beal, Joe Nocera, and Matt Chair. So I'll kick off with a question for the group. Um, your podcasts have covered a policeman, an NFL star, and a surgeon who killed people, a psychotherapist who manipulated his patients, and a family that was so involved that they are suspected of taking a hit on their ex-in-law. <laughs> Why is it that bad people are so good for storytelling? <laughs> Laura, let's start with you. I think it's the bad people who, well, they expose larger truths about problems in the system. Like Christopher Dunch, I mean, the chances of a surgeon being that bad, again, uh, are pretty small. But, but what happened in Dallas really showed all the weaknesses in the patient protection system, which made you wonder, what about a surgeon who's just half as bad? You know, what's going to happen to him? And uh, so I, I think, or in the case of Man in the Window, like how we viewed rape and, and how, we, how certain crimes were treated, I think were, were revealed by that. So I, I'd say it's the bad guys who, who tell us things that we 
didn't know and should know. Mine, what's your view? I think we've always been drawn to uh, the extremes of human behavior, whether good or bad. That's why adventure tales have always been as popular as they have been. And with true crime, like Over My Dead Body, you have a situation where it's a marriage that gets as bad as you can possibly imagine, and then worse. And you know, there's a there's a vicariousness of living through something, you know, not being able to imagine it happening to yourself, but being interested that it could go that far, and interested in those extremes. And when it's in an audio format, as opposed to on the page, it's it's more visceral, right? It's more, you know, the the connection to those extremities is is even more pronounced. So I, I think it's just a, a sort of modern spin on something we've always been really interested in. Uh, uh, apropos of that, all of you come from the world of print, and in fact, all the series that we're talking about today were both print and podcast. Um, how did listeners and readers respond differently from the podcast version compared to the print version? I'll start with you, Paige. That, that, that's a, a great question. I started, I set out to make a podcast version of our print series on the Golden State Killer, thinking that I'm going to give a voice to a generation of women who'd been silenced, women who were raped in the 70s. But what happened instead, because of the, the incredible reach of the podcast, beyond our print readership, is that we reached an, a worldwide audience. I began getting uh, feedback from people across the world who had a very intimate reaction to the series. Uh, one, because people who in some way lived in the area that was terrorized by the killer and, and rapist, but people who started responding to me about their own traumas, their own personal traumas. And they there was an incredible intimate reaction to the series that, that print didn't have. Did you find the same, Bob, when people were reacting to Gladiator and the story of Aaron Hernandez that many people already knew? Or thought they exactly. knew. Exactly. It was kind of a challenge because I think every sports fan in the country thought they knew everything there was to know about Aaron Hernandez. You know, there'd been two long murder trials and hours of television documentaries and lots of long form journalism pieces. Um, but we thought there was still more to tell and many questions to answer. And for one thing, Hernandez, nobody ever heard a public word from Hernandez from the time he was arrested until his suicide uh, in prison. Uh, so we got, uh, we had a major breakthrough when we were able to get a hold of all the recordings of his jail calls, hundreds of jail calls he made during that time. Um, and it was some of those intimate and revealing conversations he had with friends and loved ones, I, loved ones, I think, that really resonated with our listeners. We heard from many people who said that, um, you know, that we really put them in Hernandez's world in the podcast in a way that we couldn't do with our companion print series. So I think that's one of the, the power of podcasts. And, and Joe, you have a story about how a podcast turned into the window to tell a story that you've right. been following for a while. <clears throat> right, I had, um, uh, I had written a story about uh, The Shrink Next Door, which was called The House Next Door, which was never published by the New York Times. We won't get into that. <laughs> and um, I you know, sat in my bottom drawer for five years, uh, and you know, a few people had read it. And um, my son, uh, who's in the you know, TV streaming business, called me one day and he said, Dad, you got to go listen to Dirty John. And that's all he said. So I listened to Dirty John, uh, which of course was Wondery's first big hit, um, and I called him back and I said, why did you, it's great, but why did you want me to listen to it? And he said, Dad, that's how to tell your story. Um, and so I went to Bloomberg and, and it turned out at, that they, they hooked up with Wondery and they had a partnership. and. Um, you know, I wrote a good manuscript, a magazine story, 35, 40 pages, but the flexibility of the podcast format, the ability to tell it in a six-part series to, to go here and there in places that you really couldn't do in a tightly drawn magazine story was really a revelation to me. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, it's true of all of us. We're all print reporters, right? But we're all thinking, man, when can I do my next podcast? <laughs> <laughs> uh, apropos of next podcast, Laura, you're working on Bad Batch for next week. Yes. Yes. So what can you tell us about it? Because she doesn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> so Bad Batch is, um, it, it takes on a topic that I've wanted to look into for a while, and that's the stem cell industry. Uh, people are spending their life savings, their retirement, uh, borrowing money to get stem cells. 
and uh, most of the information that they get is coming from the people trying to sell it to them. So I've been wanting to tell this story for a long time to really uh, drill down into what's known and what's not known. And there was an incident that happened in Texas um, that I won't go into a lot of details now. You can listen. And um, that really gave me a narrative vehicle to take apart what happened in this case. Uh, and again, what does this say about the, the larger stem cell, for-profit stem cell industry? Thank you. Uh, to close the panel, I want to ask everybody, what's your favorite podcast, starting with Paige? Uh, my favorite is the first one that I listened to intently in order to, to dissect and create Man in the Window, and that's Crime Town Providence. It just rocks. It's just very rollicking, but, but it also is very immersive. Thank you. Bob? Uh, I, I, I came late to podcast listening. I, I, in fact, I listened to my first podcast when we started this project a couple of years ago, and it was slow burn on Watergate. You know, I'd lived through that whole culture and at the time. I was sort of a college dropout cab driver, going to school to be a journalism person, and you know, immersed in the culture. My girlfriend had a bumper sticker that said, see you later, Watergator. And so, so I, was, I was, I thought I knew everything there was to know about it, but then I, I listened to this podcast and it just opened my eyes to the real possibilities of what you can convey in podcasting. So I loved it. All right. Well, I'm gonna name two. One is the second season of In the Dark. Just, it's so good. And as a journalist, just what they went through to expose this story. But I'm also gonna put in a plug for, um, American Scandal by Lindsey Graham. Lindsey's, I record at Lindsey's studio, so I'm biased, but I, um, if you think you know stories, start with the Exxon Valdez story. If you think you know them, and then you listen to that, it's kind of like, the way you, you think you know them, and then you're like, wait a minute, that's what happened? So that would, yeah. Thank you. Well, of course, I love all the Wondery shows, and that's true, the, 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 the craftsmanship is incredible, and I think that's one of the things we all admire. But the, the, um, the podcast I want to tout here right now is called Running From Cops, um, and it's about um, what the show Cops has done to police forces, communities, and the culture, and it is scary as hell, and I think it's very powerful. Uh, if I'm being honest about the one I listen to the most, it's probably Buster Olney's uh, Baseball Tonight podcast, but that's not a, <laughs> it's not a narrative show. Um, I think that what... Uh, what the team at Serial did with the third season was really impressive. They took a, you know, they could have done another straight narrative um, murder mystery, but they used their platform to talk about the criminal justice system as a whole, and I, I was immersed from the beginning. All right. Thank you, everybody. A pleasure to work with all of you. It's an honor. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you. In conclusion, podcasts are and have always been three things, an engagement medium, an emotional medium, and a medium that sells, and now podcasts offer reach. Over the years, for many brands, podcasts have evolved from experiment to nice to have. But now with 40% penetration among under 55, podcasts are making another evolution from nice to have to must have. We've seen this picture before. When television was invented, people in the movie business derisively called it the small screen. But over the next decades, television became the main screen, the undisputed king of entertainment and advertising. People spent hours a day with it, and the ads worked, until smartphones came into the picture. For a while, the television industry ignored the screen. They thought, we thought, it was too small to deliver entertainment of any quality, and the advertising industry was skeptical too. But since then, this new screen has become the main screen to three billion consumers all over the world. They pick it up hundreds of times a day, but more often than not, only for minutes or seconds at a time. So the prevailing wisdom has been that the way to reach consumers has to be in this screen to cram shorter and shorter audiovisual messages. Well, we have good news for you. You no longer have to choose between the big screen, the small screen, and the personal screen. You can choose the screen that has no limits because it lives in the minds and the hearts of consumers. You can choose a screen that emotionally engages 
90 million American consumers every month in a way that directly drives results. You can choose podcasting the biggest screen. Thank you very much. From Wondery. From Wondery. From Wondery. From Wondery. This is a story about 33 patients who put their trust in a prominent surgeon in Dallas. 100% confidence, appreciation, admiration, love, dad. And at that moment, Watkins realizes there can be no more rationalizations, no more procrastination. Her company is corrupt and sinking fast. It's time for her to get out. She connected again and again his chest, his left eye, and through it into his brain. You think again about the one who got away, that boy on the train. Where did he go? Maybe you can find him again now that you're free. Oh, are you saying that you think maybe one of your friends would have done something like this? <laughs> yes.